Good morning, everyone. At this time, will sergeants please start their recording? PC recording has started. According to the clouds, ready to go. Backup is rolling. Thank you. And at this time, will Sergeant Hope please take it away? Thank you. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote council hearing on, on uh, environmental protection. At this time, will all panelists please turn on your videos? I repeat, at this time, will all panelists please turn on your videos? Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all cell phone to vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. I repeat, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you very much, Sergeant Hope. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Costa Constantinidis. I am chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection. Uh, today, we will hold an oversight hearing uh, on the environmental justice impacts of COVID-19 sewage disposal and here are two bills, intro 1966 of 2020 and intro 244 of 2018. Uh, intro 1966, the local law in relation to creating a pilot program to create, uh, to, to, to creating a pilot program to test sewage for COVID-19 RNA and intro 244 is a local law to amend the administrative code in relation to the sale of non-woven disposable products. SARS-CoV-2 is a human, new human coronavirus that can spread through close personal contact via re respiration of aerosols and even by interaction with surfaces. The ongoing coronavirus pandemic in the United States has already sickened more than 8 million Americans and killed more than 222,000 Americans overall. Long-standing systemic health and social inequities have put many, and many people from black and brown communities at increased risk of getting sick and dying from the coronavirus. Furthermore, it is not just increased risk. According to John Hopkins expert, Sharita Golden, MD, people of color, particularly African-Americans are experiencing more serious illness and death due to COVID-19 than white people. In fact, African-American counties account for more than 50% of the coronavirus cases and nearly 60% of the coronavirus deaths. Research indicates that novel coronavirus is present in stool and urine samples in sufficient quantity that wastewater testing can serve as pooled community monitoring. And so, until concrete data regarding the uh, infectivity of viral particles shed via these routes is established, due care should be exercised, assuming a, a potential for infectivity. Coronaviruses have been known to spread through wastewater systems, through the respiration of aerosols, created by toilet flushing, or even by faulty plumbing systems. Similarly, the novel coronavirus has been detected in fecal samples as well as in wastewater. It's not yet uh, clear whether active, or viral, active viral particles are present in fecal matter in sufficient quantities to present a plausible pathway for infection. Assuming viral particles in the sewer system, there are a variety of potential ways of exposure, including the wastewater treatment plants. Moreover, aerosol formation during the treatment process could pose a risk to wastewater treatment plant operators and, and, and facilitate dissemination. Inactivation of the coronavirus has not been studied in detail and the coronavirus has been, has been detected in treated wastewater. Tertiary uh, treatment, microfiltration, ultrafiltration, and ultrafiltration in membrane bioreactors has been shown to increase removal of uh, enteric viruses in comparison to traditional wastewater treatment plant removal. However, the wastewater plants do not uh, remove the virus entirely and highly influent viral loads can lead to insufficient reductions of viruses before discharge. While the impact of the uh, novel coronavirus in wastewater can be tested, the presence of the novel coronavirus in sewage sludge or biosols is less likely to be detected because DEP has multiple contracts with service providers to transport and reuse or dispose of our city's biosolids. The end use sites are at the discretion of the contractors subject to DEP's approval. Locations for biosolids uh, bio disposal are distributed throughout the Northeast and other states, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Georgia, Virginia, 
However, when we were sending our bowel solids to other locations or a thousand miles away to Georgia, evidence of whether the coronavirus remains viable or can remain infectious is uncertain. In uh, 1966, in relation to creating a pilot program to test sewage for COVID RNA, would it require the commissioner of DEP and consultation with the commissioner of health and hygiene to create a pilot program to test the city's wastewater plant for the presence of, of SARS-CoV-2, the strain of coronavirus that causes CO, uh, COVID-19 and submit a report with the results of the program. Intro 244 of 2018 would prohibit a retailer from selling non-woven disposable product unless it comply, complies with testing standards established by the commissioner of DEP. Understanding the spread of the novel coronavirus through the community is an integral part of formulating mitigation strategies. Monitoring wastewater and sewage sludge can provide near and real-time data pertaining to the rates of infection in the general public, enabling public health officials to craft better and more targeted responses to community spread. I wanna thank our committee staff, our committee council and moderator today, Samara Swanston. Thank you, Samara, as always. Uh, policy analyst Nadia Johnson and Nikki Chawla. Uh, thank you, Nadia, for your text messages uh, keeping me on point. Uh, financial analyst Jonathan Seltzer, my own legislative director, Nicholas Wazowski, for all their hard work. Of course, everyone who in who's not named, who is behind the scenes making this Zoom possible. Uh, thank you to our technical staff and, of course, to all of our hardworking sergeant in arms uh, who are making sure that we can get all this done. Thank you for all your hard work as well. So with that, I will turn it over to our moderator, Samara Swanston, to square on our first witness. Thank you. I'll now deliver the oath to the administration and I will call on each of you to individually record your answers to be followed by your testimony. So please raise your right hands. I'm directing this to Vinny uh, Sapienza, Pam Ilardo, Michael Delorch, and Dimitrios Katsias. And uh, that's everybody. Okay, can you, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to the council members' questions? Yes. Thank you. And now I'll turn it over to questions for uh, excuse me, and now you may testify when ready, starting with Vincent Sapienza. Can I quickly just recognize, I know Councilmember Levin and Councilmember Yeager, both from Brooklyn, are on the uh, meeting today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll begin. Uh, good morning, Chair Constantinidis. Good to see you and uh, members of the Committee on Environmental Protection. I'm Vinny Sapienza, the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. I'm here today to speak about COVID-19 and non-woven disposable products. These are important topics and I thank the council for focusing on them. I'm joined here today by DEP Deputy Commissioner Michael Deloach from our Bureau of Public Affairs and Communications and by Deputy Commissioner Pam Alardo and Director Dimitri Katias from our Bureau of Wastewater Treatment. The first agenda item today is the environmental justice impacts of COVID-19 sewage disposal. Environmental justice is a critical factor in DEP's mission to protect public health and the environment. We thank the chair for his leadership in advancing environmental justice across the city. We carefully consider public health, environmental and social impacts of all DEP projects and operations, including the design and construction of our green infrastructure assets, the prioritization of water bodies in our CSO control program, and our affordability programs for ratepayers. For our wastewater treatment programs, we go above and beyond the discharge of clean treated water, working to recover valuable resources and reducing the amounts of waste that cannot be recycled or reused. For example, we landfill about 70% of our biosolids along with screenings, as well as an estimated 40 to 50,000 tons of scum, which is grease, per year that we collect in the treatment process. While we are investing in and planning to achieve 100% of beneficial use of biosolids, we are currently investigating adding scum to on-site digestion 
to increase production of valuable biogas for beneficial reuse. There is no credible evidence that the coronavirus can be transmitted through wastewater exposure. This question has come up and so I want to answer it directly. Genetic material or the RNA fragments within the virus uh, can be detected in wastewater. This is different from the infectious virus itself. In fact, the coronavirus breaks down in sewage more easily than other pathogens that we regularly treat for. Uh, so now on to intro uh, 1966. Uh, the presence of coronavirus in waste ties into intro 1966, which calls for a pilot program to test sewage for COVID-19 RNA. Sewage testing has the potential to identify corona uh, COVID-19 outbreaks. We share the council's goal of having an effective testing program in the city. Since the spring, DEP's Bureau of Wastewater Treatment has been implementing molecular monitoring techniques in sewage and coordinating with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. The work has the potential to identify hotspots and provide early warnings about disease spread. Similar programs have been established in other cities around the country and the world. DEP has engaged with national experts to define the state of the science and assess the role that virus tracking can play. We are working directly with a team from the City University of New York and New York University, Stanford University and the University of Michigan, uh, and also leading utilities from across the US to refine the sampling and analytical methods to track genetic material, the RNA, from the novel coronavirus in the city's wastewater. In the short term, the data collected will allow us to assess trends in genetic material concentrations of the virus that causes COVID-19 within the sewage for each of the city's 14 sewer sheds. Preparing for the long term, we are building protocols and infrastructure that can be used in the future to monitor sewage for potential outbreaks of a number of viruses, such as common influenza. The tools that we are developing are not just useful for COVID. The project included co uh, collecting samples from all 14 of our wastewater resource recovery facilities twice per week. Our testing covers every neighborhood in the city because every neighborhood is a part of a sh sewer shed uh, as illustrated and you'll have the testimony on paper in front of you, but there's a map uh, that shows the sewer sheds. We were able to conduct the necessary analysis in-house at the Newtown Creek Microbiology Laboratory. At this stage, the analytical testing technology is well-developed, but technical gaps still remain due to the multiple multi-day steps and the labor-intensive nature of the analysis. We are further refining the process and we are in the process of procuring equipment such as additional centrifuges and analytical equipment. DOHMH is early on in the process of determining how they may be able to use the information we send them and how it may help with disease surveillance and decision-making. Preliminary comparisons suggest that this may be a promising contribution to existing public health data streams. We want to suggest some technical edits to the bill uh, language for intro 1966 to align with the bill testing methods and uh, best suited for work that we are doing right now. Uh, we support the bill's intent and we thank the council for supporting us in this effort. Uh, now on to intro 244. Uh, the final agenda item today is intro 244 of 2018, which relates to wipes being flushed into the sewer system. I wanna thank you for moving forward with this issue. Uh, as the council is aware, flushing anything other than human waste and toilet paper can cause serious problems in the system. Foreign objects like wipes damage the equipment at our wastewater resource recovery facilities and contribute to fat bergs that block sewer pipes. Even wipes that are labeled flushable should not be flushed. Preventing items from being flushed is critical to protect city and private infrastructure. DEP spends nearly $19 million annually to remediate the damage caused by these clogs, uh, such as cleaning sewers, disposing of wipes, and repairing damaged machinery. The prevalence of wipes has increased significantly over the last decade. Over the same period, the sales of wipes has increased as well. And there's a, a graphic uh, as well as in the, the written testimony uh, that, that shows the correlation between the amount of wipes we're removing from uh, the wastewater system and the sale of wipes. 
we want to propose significant changes to the bill text, incorporating what we have learned from and accomplished since the bill was introduced in 2018. The International Water Services Flushability Group, or IWSFG, is an international body of experts uh, who established standards in 2018 to determine whether something is truly flushable. Changes to the city sewer regulations went into effect in March of this year. The rules now prohibit any item that does not meet the IWSFG standard from being discharged into the sewer system. These are important developments since uh, intro 244 was introduced in 2018. Uh, we also launched the Trash It, Don't Flush It behavior change campaign last year. The campaign's purpose was to inform people about what is flushable. The campaigns targeted wipes, grease, uh, and any other items besides toilet paper, everything that contributes to fat burns. We relaunched the campaign from April to June of this year to remind the public about this important issue. Uh, unfortunately, we, we have not yet seen a significant change in wipes uh, in the system. DEP has been engaged in a multi-year, multi-pronged effort to address the prevalence of wipes in our sewer system. And we've made multiple public ed education attempts, including doubling down on public education since the onset of the pandemic. We changed the sewer use rules this year to prohibit flushing these items. Uh, despite our efforts, we continue to see wipes and other debris in our pipes and in our plants. And we have been unsuccessful in eliminating the problem so far. And so we are grateful to the council's partnership on this issue. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my colleagues and I are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Commissioner. Always good to see you and, and see your team as well. Pam, I miss seeing you at the uh, Jackson Heights Green Market. Uh, yeah, it's, it's always good to see you as well. Um, so I guess I'll start off with uh, just a few questions. Um, you do brought up the centrifuges and other equipment. Do we have like an ETA on when that equipment will be procured and uh, we'll be able to sort of move forward with more robust uh, um, sort of testing as you, as you talked about? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'm gonna let uh, Pam and Dimitri answer the question, but um, you know, again, thank you for your, your comments also at the beginning. We, we've done a lot of uh, good work this, this past spring and summer um, and I, I got to, you know, personally visit uh, our Newtown Creek lab a few times and seeing how the ramp up is going. Uh, but there is some you know, additional equipment that we need. We, we were uh, able to, to hire uh, three new employees uh, to, to do this work. But uh, uh, Pam or Demetri, do you have an answer on, on the procurement? Yeah, so uh, first of all, I just like to acknowledge the support we had um, throughout much of New York City and the community and beyond. And, um, including uh, Bureau President Gail Brewer, who's interested in helping us set up the COVID uh, testing lab. Um, and we, we got uh, the lab set up. Uh, it was a, a, a great effort. I'd like to recognize Dr. D Dimitri Kateas and his team. He's not a medical doctor, but he does have a PhD. Um, so uh, he, he has, was instrumental in getting that set up and collaborating across the country uh, to make it happen. So as you can imagine, it's very difficult to take sewage and look for very fine strands of RNA that are ex extremely low concentrations. And we had some existing equipment and we were able to secure filling those vacancies. Um, and we'd like to increase our throughpro throughput. Uh, so I'd like Dimitri to give us just a couple uh, details on that, if you don't mind. Certainly, uh, and thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Uh, the procurement uh, were initiated once we received approvals in the summer. Um, we've had a couple of challenges. Uh, uh, basically, the uh, equipment is rather hard to uh, locate right now and uh, wasn't back order. Uh, the centrifuges are coming in from Germany. So uh, they're en route, as I understand, with a uh, delivery anticipated in uh, mid to late November. Uh, the associated analytical equipment is also on back order. Uh, and we expect uh, that to come uh, a little before Christmas. But I would like, I'd just like to acknowledge that we currently are sampling a, a number. Jamie, you could just tell us how many samples per week we're doing and what, what the new equipment will bring us up to. Uh, well, the, currently we're uh, executing approximately 40 samples per week, uh, recognizing that this is a rather laborious uh, method. Uh, with the new equipment uh, online, we anticipate to uh, a little over double that. Uh, 
uh, while reducing the time frame from three days to two days to get analytical results back. And how closely are we working with the uh, Department of Health on this? Um, you know, I look at Boston and you know, they may be looking at an almost exponential outbreak where like hours and minutes like matter. Um, so, you know, how are we coordinating with the Department of Health on the stuff that we're finding and, and, and moving forward? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start and then I'll, I'll turn it over uh, to, to, to Pam and Dimitri. But you know, it, it's a good question in that, you know, the, the, the test and trace program that I think we've done locally has been superb. Um, and, and that's how we've really been able to keep the pandemic tamped down uh, to the extent that we have compared to you know, other places around the country. But the traditional test and trace programs those do have some shortcomings. If people aren't going to get tested, um, it, it's an issue. And, and especially in EJ communities, it can be tough you know, where you're you know, potentially uh, at home watching kids who are or telelearning or you, your spouse uh, was laid off and you, you know, you're working uh, extra shifts, extra jobs. It's, it's, it's sometimes tough for you to get out to get tested. And those people can get missed through the traditional test and trace program. But uh, by analyzing sewage, you know, if, if you're infected, um, even if you're asymptomatic, you're, you're potentially shedding that virus uh, through the sewer system and we can detect it. And it helps us to, to get that information uh, fairly quickly and, and share it uh, immediately with the health department. Uh, turn it over to Pam now, because she, she's been yeah. dealing with them directly. I, I would just like to confirm that we've, we've worked very closely with them and Dimitri meets with them regularly and we send data to them uh, pretty much as we develop it. And Dimitri, do you, have, you can add some more detail on that. Certainly, we provide data to uh, DOHMH uh, two times per week uh, currently, um, uh, that data provides uh, for all 14 sewer sheds, uh, the uh, levels of the uh, RNA uh, that uh, was in the influent uh, to the treatment facilities. Um, we um, have been discussing with them the, uh, the nature of the data because this is a atypical data stream. Uh, there is not uh, the type of data that they are used to uh, utilizing. So um, they are working on um, better understanding the correlations and um, uh, understanding how they can best integrate that data into their uh, epidemiological models, which are uh, rather complicated and um, they have a long track record in, in utilizing. How we coordinate with other jurisdictions that may have testing you know, programs as well. I mean, I referenced Boston, but I, are, we, are we talking with them about, you know, um, best practices or how are we coordinating with other cities that are maybe doing the same thing or may have this, you know, have these you know, pieces of equipment already and, you know, are moving ahead. So like, what are we teaching them? What are they teaching us? How, how is that back and forth going so far? Ed, Pam, I'll let you talk about yeah, that. I, I'd just like to say that, uh, you know, as soon as we knew that COVID uh, existed or this version of it, uh, we had immediate uh, interactions across the country with universities and our utility partners. So uh, we got ahead of the curve on it and um, we're continuing to find, uh, to pursue the ob objectives of doing this, this analysis. So uh, Dimitri <laughs> was probably on the phone and on Zoom meetings uh, 24 seven uh, in the first couple of months of this. And uh, uh, we've been very engaged. We could add, you know, Dimitri, you can provide a little bit more background there. Certainly, um, there have been um, three mechanisms that we've been uh, engaging across uh, the country and actually also uh, with uh, European utilities. Uh, one mechanism was uh, the, our academic partners uh, that uh, Vinny spoke of, our uh, commissioner spoke of earlier, uh, which uh, included um, uh, Stanford, uh, University of Michigan, some of the uh, powerhouses in this specific area of uh, coronavirus detection. Uh, we uh, worked with uh, the local academics, uh, our City University of New York partners who were amazing in terms of both method development in terms of the fundamentals as well as training of our staff. Uh, we worked also with NYU uh, who uh, supported us in developing methodologies to actually sample and then to bank those samples and freeze them and so forth. 
Uh, from the utility side, uh, we've worked uh, with uh, the Hampton Road Sanitary District in particular. I need to give them a shout out because uh, they really had a mature program uh, that uh, targeted microbial source tracking. And we were able to learn a lot from their more than six years of experience in uh, this type of molecular method. Um, on our end, uh, uh, we have also been engaging with uh, national and international research organizations, such as the Water Research Foundation, uh, where, for example, I've served as a uh, project uh, committee member uh, on development and execution of a project where we got over 30 laboratories from across the U.S. to test uh, samples so we can better understand the various analytical methods and what their limitations and what potential optimizations we can execute on those. Are there things that other jurisdictions are doing that we've decided not to do or maybe found unnecessary? Um, well, if I may take that. Uh, Please. Um, so there, uh, there, in the beginning, especially in uh, March and April, there was uh, a lot of uncertainty, as you can imagine, in terms of the analytical methods. And uh, we were all actually trying different uh, type of uh, technologies. Um, after um, three very rough months of developing uh, in parallel multiple uh, analytical methods, uh, we were able to eliminate the need for an ultra centrifuge, which is a specific type of uh, method, um, because we are uh, we do have a um, uh, some special considerations here to, to the size of our system. The fact that we need to run samples for fourteen plants, uh, not one, two, or three, and in addition to that, um, uh, be able to go upstream into the sewer sheds if called upon to uh, look at uh, sources in greater resolution. Uh, so just the, the throughput that we required uh, re forced us to eliminate some of the simpler methods that uh, other laboratories were using. Okay. Um, so are we going to put our, do we do open data? Do we share our results on open data portal at all? Yeah, I guess, you know, Mr. Chairman, we, we, we thought about that and, and just, I guess, because I got to look at what the data looks like. And I don't know how useful it would be. It wasn't useful to me. I, I didn't know what I was looking at. So how we can you know put it in a format that's useful to anybody other than the health department seems to be a challenge. Um, I don't know. I, I know, Michael Deloach, you've, you've looked at this, too. I don't know if you want to say anything. Can we turn on Michael's microphone. Yeah. yeah, can you hear me now? Ben? Yeah, all right, there he is. So yeah, we're continuing to review it. It's just a question of how we can adapt the data. So we're, we're continuing to, to look into it to see if it's possible. Have we talked to other jurisdictions? I mean, I, I keep going back to Boston, but Boston seems to be able to, I mean, I, I saw their data on Twitter um, and you know, it, uh, it seemed pretty easy for me to understand. Are we kind of coordinating with other jurisdictions on how they're releasing their data in an open portal format? It's definitely something we can do more of. We can we can do more of that. I'm, I'm not sure who we've talked to, but we can definitely figure out the best way to try and get the information you know, publicly accessible. All right, we have, um, I looked at their data and it frightened me prior to this hearing because um, it showed that a potential huge outbreak in, in that city is on the way. Um, and you know, having that data Internally and both externally, letting people know, hey, you know, there's something on the horizon here. You should be doubly careful, right? And, you know, we need to reinforce. I mean, I think there's sort of like some COVID fatigue going on where people aren't masking up. They're, I was in, you know, don't judge. I, I take my son to get his glasses and he begged to go to McDonald's. It wasn't my first choice. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I was in there and there was someone there without a mask and I was, you know, mortified by it. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, you know, I've had COVID and it, it's, it's, it's not something anyone wants. Um, yeah. So I, I think we did some COVID fatigue and I think, you know, having data, I would say, um, just sort of looking at you know, hot spots before they're happening, here's what's going on in, in this quadrant of the city or that quadrant of the city might be useful just both to the health department and to the general public. 
Yeah, definitely. And as you know, we continue to build this out and, and increase its effectiveness and we'll, we'll continue to figure out ways that we can, you know, use the information and help the public to, you know, stay, stay, you know, cautious and, and stay safe during these difficult times. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I guess the, the last uh, question I wanted to ask with testing always waiting facilities or results in the and I definitely want to recognize Councilmember Menchaca. Uh, no, he's here as well. Does he have any questions? I'm guessing not. Okay. All right. So, and once we have this, the last question I have once we have this new. Uh, these new technologies, right? The, the, the new centrifuges and new equipment is saying the centrifuges should be here in before Thanksgiving. The other equipment should be here before Christmas. It, what does that look like? You know, how do we, how soon can we get them online? Like, what does it look like as far as being able to integrate them into what we're doing? Yeah. Dimitri, go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, with respect to the centrifuges, we can get those online because they're equivalent to equipment that we already have uh, very rapidly within a week or so. And that will allow us to uh, boost production uh, from the uh, uh, 40 samples we're running currently up to about uh, 50, 55 samples we anticipate. Uh, and then the next boost will occur when the uh, digital PCR uh, equipment comes in. Uh, and that is what uh, we anticipate will take us up to our uh, 80 uh, sample uh, threshold. Um, the DPCR equipment uh, will take a bit. We anticipate about a month to get fully online due to the complexity associated with that equipment. All right, so uh, with that, um, I don't have any other questions. Do any of my colleagues have any questions? I mean, tomorrow I'll pass it to you to see if there's anybody that um, has raised their hand. Does anyone else want to answer, ask questions of the administration at this time? Okay, well, seeing no more council questions, this would wrap up the administration's testi testimony. We can turn now to the public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for particular panelists should use the raise hand function in Zoom. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon the setting of the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce your testimony before beginning your testimony. Your testimony will be limited to five minutes. Commissioner, uh, everyone else, I just want to thank you all for your testimony today, since there are no more other questions from our council staff or council members. Um, thank you for your hard work during this difficult time. I look forward to coordinating with you on this legislation. Um, and I do agree with you. I, you know, I didn't ask any questions about the bill, and Councilmember Noso is not here. Uh, I think we all agree there is no such thing as a flushable wipe. Uh, so thank you um, for all of your work. Thanks. Be well, Council. Thank you as well. If I don't speak to you, I'll have a wonderful holiday Thanksgiving. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You too. Now, I would like to welcome Borough President Gail Brewer to testify, followed by Kathy Nizari. Borough President Gail Brewer. Your time starts please, now. Please, please do not put the Borough President on a clock. Let her speak as long um, as she can. Copy that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will try to stick to the time, however, and I want to thank you, Chair Constantinese, because your work on the Environmental Protection Committee is legendary. 
Um, and this is just one more example. So I am very supportive of intro 1966. That's what I'm going to talk about. And I don't know if it's a pilot program, but it sure is needed to be something that we talk about because it has taken a little bit too long, as you hinted, to get the city up and going on this uh, wonderful uh, program to look at wastewater as a strategy to detect the potential spread of COVID and other god awful viruses that might come about. Um, I know that we've all got the numbers. I'm just going to summarize uh, of how many New Yorkers have died. I don't know if this would have helped, but I wish that it had existed previously. Uh, I think we know that testing sewage is an effective way to detect the spread of COVID-19 and anything else. I know that Holland and other uh, countries, and as you said, Boston, have been using this effectively. So in my situation, the reason I was uh, interested is, I think you know we have a very active Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board. I think this one getting started in Queens now, and that's a good thing. And as, as a result of their advocacy, uh, we wrote to the governor and the mayor saying to make sure that this program existed, that it was a great strategy uh, for dealing with this horrible pandemic. Uh, we also reached out to Professor Kevin Viscalia, who's at Hofstra, and he pointed out that the potential for looking and tracking the prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 in New York would be very enhanced by this program. I am a Pam Alardo fan, and I think you are also. You can go to the, you have the advantage, as I heard earlier, of going to the market, the green market and seeing her. I just watch her over Zoom and then I've been to Newtown Creek and seen the amazing work she does. So really a lot of this is due to her leadership. Um, I think starting in the spring and then into August, uh, DEP developed and this measure, this validated method to measure the viral RNA of all sewage. And they're continuing to do this. They're working very, very closely. That was a good question with h, h Department of Health, academics, hospitals, and labs all across the country. I think originally starting with Stanford, but Stanford is Stanford. We need to be New York and do it ourselves. Um, and I think that, uh, as you heard earlier, they <clears throat> have the 40 samples per week, but we obviously need to do more as soon as the equipment arrives. But it's taken a while for her to be able to get this off. So I've got like three suggestions. I think that if the council mandates wastewater testing for COVID, and I think you will, then DEP must have the money and the resources. Um, I knew as early as June 18th uh, that the, you know, when she and I were on a panel discussing wastewater testing, the DEP was ready to move full speed ahead as soon as OMB approved the release of funds for the salaries of the three scientists and the money for the equipment. I think it was only 230,000. I was gonna do a GoFundMe in order to purchase it at that point because of the need for it. OMB eventually allowed the hiring to proceed and we're working on the equipment as you heard, but this has been a delay and it needs to not be a delay in the future. If anything new comes along that she needs, the city needs to provide it. Number two, as you know, 1966 requires collaboration between DEP and the health department to report on and determine the feasibility of expanding the proposed pilot, although I think we're beyond the pilot now. Uh, DEP is in regular communication with all the agencies, but particularly health and HH, uh, so that the data collected through wastewater testing is integrated into these agencies' own data streams for more comprehensive detection of COVID-19 community spread and anything else that could come along. Once detected working across agencies, it is vital to coordinate testing and tracing, but it will work even better if DEP has the resources to be able to do that targeting. And number three, as you heard earlier, and thank you uh, for suggesting this, Mr. Chair, I am a big believer, as you know, of the New York City Open Data Portal, having had something to do with its initiation. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that, um, you know, it may be hard to unravel the data, but there are a lot of smart people in New York City. And so I stress the importance of ongoing data collection, analysis, and sharing. And I really urge the council in that bill, intro 1966, to say that data collected through wastewater testing must be made available publicly on the New York City open data portal because there are many people, it takes a village to do anything in this city, and having that data available. We may have other ideas that come out of it. Congratulations on this hearing. In college, I wrote my thesis on wastewater 
uh, treatment facilities, of which I know nothing, but it is certainly something that is incredibly important to our city. I would definitely appreciate your hearing and your knowledge. And like I said, Pam Arlardo walks on water. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, uh, Madam Borough President, I'll just say that you, know, you have been an inspiration to me as an elected official from uh, my first time working for Councilmember Darling Mealing and being down the hall from your office. Uh, I remember you know, seeing all of your hard work and you've set the bar very high uh, for, the, for what an elected official can accomplish and how hard one elected official should work. So thank you for your commitment to the city and all that you do. And, and you've always been an inspiration to me and so many others. So thank you for all that you do. And thank you for testifying today. Thank you. And uh, I do agree with you that Pamela Arter walks on water. Um, I met her on top of a wastewater treatment plant. <laughs> hey, first time. Our that first time, very based. It was a lot of fun, um, you know. So uh, Pam is is Pam and the whole DEP team um, really worked so very hard, and and yeah, I to wholeheartedly agree with you, and I definitely look at your edits and uh, agree with you, and I look forward to advancing this bill with your assistance and and partnership. Thank you. And next, we'll hear from. Paul Storella. Time starts now. Uh, Kathy, Kathy Nazari, or is that we called her? She's she's not here at the present time. Otherwise, okay. I would be calling her. Okay, thank you. Can you uh, hear me? Yes, Paul, your time starts now. Can you? Okay, thank you. Um, first, I'd like to thank the members of the Committee on Environmental um, Protection, and particularly Committee Chair Constantinidis for the opportunity to testify um, today in support of creating a pilot program to test sewage for COVID-19 RNA. My name is Paul Storella and I run AECOM's Water Group in New York. In this capacity, I have worked with the New York City Department of Environmental Protection for more than 20 years on large water and wastewater infrastructure projects. For the past six months, I have been leading AECOM's efforts to monitor wastewater for COVID-19 RNA and have been directly involved in implementing pilot studies across the country, from as close as Bergen and Westchester counties to the Commonwealth of Kentucky and to the city of Phoenix. As the only leading indicator of COVID-19, wastewater analysis can serve as an early warning system to quickly establish the presence of the virus in the general population. Studies have demonstrated that COVID-19 RNA can be detected up to two weeks before symptoms um, emerge, which is particularly significant given that the virus can be transmitted um, by people who are asymptomatic. The presence and concentration of RNA from the virus can indicate an imminent increase or decrease of virus infections when, when routinely tested over a given time and when monitoring the trends. The resulting data can then be used proactively to inform public policy decisions that can help protect public health. This method is not new. Uh, similar wastewater analysis has been performed for years to detect opioid concentrations, norovirus, antibiotic resistant bacteria, poliovirus, and measles throughout the world. In many countries, including the Netherlands, Finland, and Germany, currently test for COVID-19 RNA. An interesting case study is Israel's sewer surveillance program, which was established in 1989 by the Ministry of Health to detect polio virus from samples um, collected weekly from sewage trunk lines and treatment plants, utilizing the same test we now use to detect the novel um, coronavirus. In 2013, polio virus was detected and the Ministry of Health acted quickly to vaccinate the public. Consequently, none of the effect, none of the infections resulted in paralysis. Given the long history of wastewater analysis, there are some lessons learned that New York City can benefit from. First is frequency and turnaround time. To identify virus trends up to two weeks in advance of the appearance of medical symptoms in the general public, Testing must be performed no less than twice per week, as you're proposing here. 
and results um, delivered ideally within 48 hours of sampling. The trends that emerge from reviewing the results over time can inform, can inform proactive mitigation strategies to help slow the spread of the virus. But time lag that extends data collection can diminish the utility of the results. In addition to New York City's 14 wastewater treatment facilities, there are opportunities to sample other, other locations, including manholes and pumping stations. Okay. Given the city's size and population, these types of sites could help identify more localized areas of infection while still maintaining um, um, anonymous data. The, the, more, the more granular data can inform efforts to contain the virus in these smaller hotspots, protect the most vulnerable in those areas, and avoid large-scale shutdowns, all in advance of medical symptoms appearing in these populations. Finally, it is important to consider the possible need to normalize samples that are um, taken on different days and in different areas, accounting for variations in wastewater strength, which can be impacted by a number of factors, including intrusion of, of uh, groundwater and stormwater into the sewage collection system. This is a quality assurance measure that will help ensure accuracy of the daily results and thus the trends over time. As the only leading indicator of COVID-19, wastewater monitoring is an essential tool to limit the spread um, of a highly contagious and potentially lethal virus and help keep New York City safe. The pilot program is an excellent first step towards implementing a broader citywide wastewater monitoring program to uh, protect us in the uh, future from viruses both known and unknown and prevent the uh, potential catastrophic effects of another novel coronavirus. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And, and thank you to ACOM. I know we've had an opportunity to speak and I appreciate your coordination with the city uh, on this topic and other topics as well. Um, so I, I think that uh, partnerships like that should continue and we should continue to seek out the best science possible as we move forward here um, to get this right and to make sure that we're safe. Thank you. Thank you. Agreed. And next we will hear from Jessica Franken. Time starts now. <clears throat> Can you hear me? I can. Great, thank you so much. Um, good morning, Mr. or good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and honorable members of the committee, um, as well as committee staff and Sergeant at Arms staff. Um, my name is Jessica Franken and I am here on behalf of INDA, uh, the Association of the Nonwoven Fabrics Industry. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to testify today uh, to share our concerns regarding intro 244. Um, just by way of background, INDA is the trade association that represents disposable wipes, uh, fabric makers, wipes manufacturers, and some brand owners. Our members are committed to designing wipes that meet consumer expectations and their health and hygiene needs while min minimizing post-consumer impacts on municipal wastewater infrastructure and the environment. Uh, as such, we do, of course, share the city's concern about the persistent problem of wastewater system Clogs. However, despite the bill author's best intentions and, and that of DEP, um, we do believe that the uh, Intro 244's proposed solution of mandating a, a performance standard, possibly the IWSFG standard that Mr. Sapienza described um, for flushable wipes, simply will not address the problem at hand. And that's really the inappropriate flushing of products that are not labeled as flushable. Um, numerous forensic studies that have been conducted by wastewater uh, professionals of, of systems in various uh, locations throughout the years, including Jacksonville, Florida, the United Kingdom, Portland, Maine, Minnesota, and even in an independent study that was commissioned by the New York City Department of Environmental Protection and Law Department in 2016, 
have all repeatedly shown that the real culprit in sewer systems is the incorrect flushing of items that are not labeled flushable. So these are things like non-flushable baby wipes, uh, household cleaning wipes, disinfecting wipes, uh, feminine hygiene products, and things like uh, paper hand towels. Um, by stark contrast in these studies, wipes that are labeled flushable represented a mere 1 to 2 percent of what's being found on sewer system screens and in clogs. This is because flushable wipes already undergo rigorous testing under the industry's longstanding guidelines, um, currently in their fourth iteration, in order to be labeled flushable. These guidelines require a wipe labeled flushable to undergo seven different tests in order to establish um, compatibility with the sewer system. And those tests look at various um, points in which a wipe would travel through the system. Um, the results from these forensic studies that I've cited, which are also have been provided to the committee in advance of the hearing and uh, formal reports that have been issued, um, I really believe speak for themselves. Rather than develop a potentially problematic standard for flushable wipes that would do nothing to address the problem affecting wastewater systems, or at least nothing in a meaningful way, um, INDA would like to offer ourselves up with the opportunity to collaborate um, with city and local wastewater operators to develop a cooperative approach aimed at addressing and correcting the improper disposable, disposal of wipes and items that are not labeled flushable that are clearly demonstrated to cause clogs and accumulate in systems. In fact, INDA has several examples of successful collaboration with both various local jurisdictions as well as wastewater operators in several locations, including recently earlier this year uh, in Washington State. Um, INDA believes that this type of approach would be far more effective at reducing the unwanted debris in New York, New York City sewer systems, um, and we're hopeful to have this opportunity to partner with you to tackle the problem of non-flushable wipes in the city's wastewater system. Um, I don't want to push up too much on my time, so I'm going to stop here, but I really do appreciate having the opportunity. I would like to express my thanks to your committee staff um, who were very helpful in getting me online and ready to and prepared to participate today in, on very short notice. So thank you for that. Um, happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, you know, as I mentioned during my, my time, I talked about the, the challenges that we hear, see here in New York City that there really is no such thing as a flushable wipe here in New York City. Right. And wouldn't you sort of glean from, uh, you know, people putting things, you know, wipes that maybe aren't labeled flushable as some level, you know, some measure of confusion, right? They're putting flood, they're putting non-flushable wipes and flushable wipes, they're buying wipes, you know, that your industry sort of sort of creating this myth that there is a flushable wipe, and therefore people just believe they can flush whatever wipes there are because you know it's it's you're creating this myth. Well, as you can imagine, I would disagree with you about it being a myth. And again, I would say that if you look at the data, you would see that flushable wipes are performing um, as they were intended. But to your point about confusion and the need for consumers to better understand um, what they should and should not be flushing, you make an excellent point. And so when I reference the collaborations that we've been engaged with, with cities and other wastewater operators, these were locations, and again, I mentioned Washington State, but these were locations that saw that the primary problem in their systems were the flushing of these non-flushable wipes and other items um, that should never be flushed. And so what we were able to do is to work with these wastewater system operators to develop more targeted campaigns and educational materials in order to be able to make sure that people know that they should not be flushing those products. Um, you know, I think our concern here is with a standard like what the IWSFG has developed, this could end up, it's so unnecessarily stringent that this could end up resulting in the availability of flushable wipes going away, um, but the behavior of consumers using these wipes, what they've come to rely upon, um, you know, in bathroom settings, elderly, caregivers, a lot of vulnerable populations do rely on these products. 
um, is that the behavior will still remain, but the, the one product that actually does work isn't going to be available anymore. Um, so I think for us, you know, we see an opportunity to both tackle the real problem by having, having more targeted messaging, um, but also to, you know, again, make sure that the city's problems don't worsen um, by potentially imposing standards that are so overly rigid and un unnecessarily so um, that they end up making it such that flushable wipes aren't available to consumers, then people ship their purchases to baby wipes and, and other very strong wipes, which are causing the problems. Oh, I appreciate your testimony today, Ms. Frank, and thank you so much for being on. I appreciate your time yeah. and your efforts. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it again. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. At this time, I'd like to ask, is there anyone who has registered to testify, but whose name I have not called? If so, please raise your hand using the Zoom function. <clears throat> Seeing none, I will now turn it over to Chair Constantinides for any closing remarks. I mean, I just want to, uh, again, thank uh, the entire team. Um, you know, first, uh, you know, the DEP team, Vinny Sapienza, Pam Lardo, uh, Dimitri, um, thank you for, uh, Michael Deloche, thank you for your testimony today. I look forward to partnering with you uh, as we move forward on 1966 and 244. Um, I want to thank our own staff, uh, our committee council and moderator today, uh, Samara Swanston, uh, our policy analysts, both Nadia Johnson and Nikki, uh, Ricky Chawla, uh, our, uh, our sergeant at arms, who have been doing a great job as always. Thank you. Uh, Joanna Castro, uh, who's helped with the Zoom and all the technical staff that's, uh, you know, Tears and Nasser, everyone who's helped, uh, Megan Shen, everyone who has been behind the scenes today to make sure this did well. My own staff, uh, Nicholas Wazowski, my legislative director, and all those who testified who gave of their time today to make sure that the city uh, emerges from this crisis uh, better equipped to uh, deal with the challenges of both COVID and future potential outbreaks uh, and pandemics. Um, so I look forward to moving these bills. Um, and uh, of course, I wanna thank our speaker, Corey Johnson for his great leadership as well. Um, so seeing no one else willing to testify today uh, I, I, I want to gavel this committee hearing of the Environmental Protection Committee on uh, October 26th closed. 